Okay, hello everyone. My name is Brittany McGuire, and I am a member of the Public Relations Student Society of America, also known as PRSSA. First off, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. On behalf of PRSSA, I'd like to thank the Committee on Lectures and everyone who's been involved in helping our group bring in Tim Mankey. To tell you a little bit about PRSSA, we are a public relations club on campus. One of our upcoming events planned for the middle of November is PR Week, which includes a series of events revolving around corporate social responsibility. We will be hosting several canned good drives that week and we'll be bringing in Ed Nicholson from Tyson Foods, who will be discussing their hunger relief and awareness efforts. Our PRSSA works hard to enhance our members' knowledge of public relations and provide them access to professional development opportunities and networking. This is why we enjoy bringing in amazing speakers like Tim Mankey, who is here with us tonight. Tim Mankey is a senior publicist for 20th Century Fox Entertainment and was previously the senior publicist for Paramount Pictures. He has had profound experience in strategic development and execution of publicity campaigns for over 100 films. He has received the Maxwell Weinberg Showmanship Award for Outstanding Achievement in Motion Picture Publicity for Braveheart, Titanic, and Borat. He has also received the Les Mason Award, which is the highest honor bestowed upon, be, upon publicists. So finally, it is my honor to introduce to you Tim Mankey. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I just want to start and actually tell you a little bit about who I am. I actually am a graduate. I was in the class of 86 here at Iowa State. And um, I, I didn't finish in four years. It actually took me quite a while to finish because um, I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, when I got to Iowa State. But I was here. And um, we have people who can't hear you, so we're going to move that out. And there we go. And then you can. And can you hear me now? <laughs> can you hear me now? All right. So, um, I ended up eventually, actually my advisor just said, can you just leave? And she had a strategy that instead of finally deciding on a major, I would have three minors. Because I had dabbled here, dabbled there, and dabbled everywhere. So I eventually did get a degree. And I had three minors. One was in marketing, one was in political science, and one was in journalism. So as part of my political science minor, I did an internship in the state legislature. And I, I worked with a, a great representative from the local area here. But while I was there, I met another representative who actually was running for statewide office at about the same time. She went on to win that office, and um, she won about the same time I was graduating. So as luck would have it, I had a job. But as it would turn out, I would find out that maybe politics wasn't what I wanted to do. So I kind of had an epiphany because I had been born in Iowa, I raised in Iowa, gone to school in Iowa, had graduated at, from a college in Iowa, university, and now I was working at the state house down in Des Moines. So I kind of wanted to make a change because I thought, oh no, I'm going to just always have been in Iowa. Nothing against Iowa, but I had been there quite a while already, so I wanted to try something different. So I, I, I moved to Hollywood, to Los Angeles actually. When I got there, I was like, okay, I'm ready for a new career. It's not going to be politics. What is it I want to do? I'm not a person who's ever read a novel, but I love magazines. I love newspapers. I love that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, I was so naive, I really didn't make the connection that Los Angeles was the heart of entertainment. But then I got thinking, well, maybe I could get a job that kind of incorporated publications, and um, I, I did it. I got very lucky. I was at the right place at the right time, and I got a career started. I had to do an entry-level position to begin with in the uh, Paramount Pictures uh, publicity department, but uh, I did that, paid my dues, and eventually became a publicist. So I got very lucky. I have what I think is the greatest job. So I went from politics to entertainment, and there's really not that much difference between them. But it's um, interesting because you get to work on campaigns on every film, but basically as a studio publisher, you're a gun for hire, and you don't get to pick and choose what films you want. 
but it also makes my job so interesting because every few months or every month I have a new film that's coming out in theaters, at a local theater to you. So I never get bored about my job because it's always a different kind of project. So we start at the very beginning, we look at what project's coming down the pipe, and we decide, let's build a strategy of how best to convince you to put $8 out of your pocket to go into the theater to see the motion picture. We figure out what strategy it is that's going to get you to buy that ticket, and then we implement it. I've worked on all sorts of genre films, and I've done animation film, drama, comedies, action thrillers, uh, you know it, um, just, it runs a gambit. But as I said, you don't always get to pick your films. Sometimes you get a film that you just absolutely love. Uh, the Devil Wears Prada, I thought was a very good film. I was very happy to work on it. And it was very successful because a lot of people bought tickets to that film. It seemed like you could build a campaign around that, not just based on the fact that it was a good film, but also that it had a film that had a message because it was about the boss from hell. We've all had that boss from hell, or you soon will be working for a boss from hell. And you can then rent out uh, The Devil Wears Prada and try to relate to it. But then I always tell the story about private parts. Because they said, OK, your next film is private parts. I can't stand Howard Stern. But I, I, you know, they're gonna, I want a paycheck, so I'm going to find myself working on a Howard Stern film. At the end of the day, I love Howard Stern. Howard Stern was a terrific person to work with because he got it. He understood the value of publicity. He knew that if he publicized his film, more of you would shell out some bucks to see his movie. So I would say, I would like you to do a telephone interview with the Houston Chronicle. And he would say, OK. And I was like, oh, I just worked with so-and-so last month. And when I asked them to do a photo spread for Vanity Fair, they said no. Howard Stern did not know the word no, and he was a pleasure to work with. And so um, you just never know what your kind of experience with your film would be. As much as The, um, the uh, Devil Wears Prada was a success, another favorite film of mine, and I spoke about it last time I was here, was The Film Election with Reese Witherspoon and Matthew Broderick. I thought it was a fantastic film, and I had real passion for it. But I think three people went and paid to see the movie. As much as we tried, we could not sell a single ticket. I have worked 10 years, or almost 11 years, at Paramount Pictures. While I was at Paramount Pictures, I worked on domestic campaigns, which was essentially working with the outlets that you read, that you watch, that you go online with, and trying to sell the movie. The last two years, I have been at 20th Century Fox. I have a new family, but I also have a new world. But instead of domestic publicity, I'm now concentrating on international publicity. Believe it or not, most of the money that films make for the studios come from international markets. As much as our focus is on the domestic effort, if the money comes in internationally. I'd like to just take a moment and just, um, I have three posters over here. This is sort of my past. Um, I had a great experience working on Borat. A, it was a great movie. It was a unique movie, and it had a lot of opportunities to um, you know, present it to you as beyond. Um, it was nothing but silly, funny entertainment. There was no sub-theme about um, a boss from hell, or whether you um, knew a mean girl when you were in high school. It was just pure comedy, funny. So we uh, presented it on that level. And uh, it did very well in the marketplace, both domestically and internationally. Uh, Juno is another favorite film that I've enjoyed working on. And um, it did not do so well internationally. It just didn't translate necessarily about her story on an international market. But uh, a good project and fun to work with. The next one poster here is What Happens in Vegas. I worked on that film exclusively on international. It, uh, it made decent money domestically but international markets could not get enough of this movie. It was very, very, it was a cash cow. I mean, audiences in Japan, 
in Mexico City, they could not get enough of this movie. But when you come to think about it, Vegas is an American icon. And so if you don't live here and you live abroad, you're just like envious of like a city like Vegas. You want to know as much information you can find out about Vegas. So when we put the theme of this movie, just lent itself to um, going internationally very big. And these actors were both very eager and very willing to work hard for the movie. I understand Ashton was here about a week ago. So um, he, he had no problem touring for films. Um, the future is on this side of the stage. Um, the first two are movies that open domestically here this coming Friday. And um, have you heard of The Secret Life of Bees? So when I say have you heard of, that's the question whether you've seen an advertisement or if you've seen a trailer in the theater or if you watched the Oprah show and saw the whole cast on. When you saw the Oprah show and saw the whole cast on or if you saw Dakota on the Ellen show today, that's publicity. But the fact that you saw it in a theater as a trailer before some other movie, that is marketing but not publicity. And the fact that you saw a TV spot Advertisement is again advertising, not publicity. I just want to make clear the distinction that there are many elements of marketing, but I'm here as a publicist. And um, then we talk about the, the uh, feature stories, the TV appearances. Max Payne also opens on Friday, the Mark Wahlberg film. And uh, we just did a press for that this past weekend. Hopefully, you're anticipating these movies, and if you are, I hope that my, myself and my fellow publicists have, been, have encouraged you. Who, who wants to see Australia? Yeah. So the topic, we're just trying to build the buzz on that. Um, Australia kind of, kind of makes me think of the film Titanic, um, which was an interesting project that I worked on in that when initially Titanic was supposed to come out in the summer, it was not anticipated. <laughs> And people were not looking forward to it. And there was negative buzz about the film because they were saying that the film was going to go over budget and that there were accidents on the set and everything. But then the film couldn't come out in June, so they moved it to an opening in December. And the delay in release gave us six more months to kind of massage and make, make it from bad buzz to positive buzz. And we did succeed, obviously, because it became the all-time highest grossing film ever. Um, Australia will be coming to a theater near you in November, and uh, I encourage you to buy a ticket. And I encourage you to keep your eyes open. Uh, Nicole Kidman is on the cover of Elle this month. Uh, Hugh Jackman is on the cover of Men's Journal. Those are just some of the publicity efforts that work to get you to buy the ticket. <coughs> then there's the, the day the earth stood still, which is uh, presenting itself with all sorts of interesting challenges because it's a remake. And actually, people really, 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 really like the original. And so they're leery about this film. Are we, how can that be as good as the original film? But it's the original film done many years later with the advent of all the special technologies and stuff that they can do to the film. Who read the novel or the book, uh, Marley and Me? Who likes dogs? Who would pay $8 to see a great movie about a good dog? All right. So that's another project that, uh, that opens on Christmas Day. So that's sort of who I am, what I'm working on, what I used to work on, where I, what I'm doing, et cetera. So I just want to get a sense of who you are. Who among us saw Beverly Hills Chihuahua? The number one movie in America, and we have one person. OK. So do you see movies? That just wasn't your cup of tea. <laughs> Who's, who has seen a movie in the last two weeks? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good audience here. Um, who saw any movies uh, this past summer? The movie sees. Okay, everybody. Okay, with almost out of exception, everyone has been to the movies. So far this year, there have been 481 movies. And how many movies, think about how many of those 481 movies have you seen? One, two, three. It's like 
you have lots and lots of options when it comes to buying a ticket for a movie. So we're trying to get you to come to our movie. Who saw The Dark Knight? Who liked The Dark Knight? All the hands remained, uh, all the hands still stayed up. Yeah, that, that film is made, it's challenging. It's on the, on the heels of the all-time highest grossing movie ever, Titanic. And uh, it's not gonna make it, so I still have the record with Titanic, but Dark Knight has made a significant amount of money. Other hits this summer have been Iron Man, Indiana Jones, uh, and those are the top three movies so far this year. And they're all sort of that same kind of adventure, interesting kind of film. But also in the top 10 films for 2008 so far are two movies that appeal to a whole different demographic. Sex in the City. Good. And how about Mamma Mia? Okay, interesting. Okay, so they each have made about $150 million just simply domestically. Mamma Mia has, has, you know, ABBA is huge internationally, and so that film has done very well um, internationally. Sex and the City, not so much. But, I mean, the, it had its market. How many of you here get your movie information from magazines like Entertainment Weekly? How many get your movie information from guest appearances on The Tonight Show? How are y'all finding out about movies? <laughs> Would it be yahoo.com or other online outlets? Because if there's been one change since I started this career back in 1991, is the onset of online. It has made a huge difference of how we get our information to you. As I said, my job is to get my film in front of you for consideration for your $8. And how do I do that? I build relationships with individual outlets. I know somebody at Entertainment Weekly when I was working domestically, and it was a matter of I would go to the person and say, I would like you to write a story about my film. And that person would usually do it because he had, or she, had the audience that I wanted. The readership of that magazine were willing to buy the ticket. But I had what that person wanted, which was access to the talent in the movie. So if you want to write a story about the upcoming Australia with Nicole Kidman, I will pitch that to you, and you will want her because you know your audience wants to know about her. So we have that kind of relationship. But every film that I get is not necessarily a good film. So sometimes I have to turn to that person and say, I have a film, well none of these, so let's see, what's a good film? Oh. Alien versus Predator 2. <laughs> Now, I really think that you should write a story about Alien versus Predators 2. And they're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm like, do you know that I have Australia coming in a few months? <laughs> so it's sort of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You do me a favor here and just, just say something positive about Alien versus Predator 2. And then I will make sure that when Australia comes, you're the first person I give access to in terms of the talent on that movie. So that's sort of how we do it. It really has nothing to do about the quality of movies. In fact, I have a story to tell you. I've been at 20th Century Fox for two years. We have, there is a, who knows RottenTomatoes.com? Okay, for those of you who do not raise your hand, did not raise your hand, what well, Rotten Tomatoes, by the way, RottenTomatoes.com is owned, this is ironic and you'll get the irony later, it's owned by 20th Century Fox. It is a group of critics who give their rating to a movie. And so they either say it's a good tomato, a bad tomato, rotten tomato, 
And so at the end of the day, when like 100 critics weigh in on a movie, it gets a percentage. You know, 50% said it was positive. 80% said it was positive. Well, for the last 22 straight releases, with one exception, Horton Hears a Who, the last 22 releases from 20th Century Fox have scored below 50%. <laughs> the critics hate our movies. So what do you do? As much as the critics hate our movies, we've made some money. We've been very, very profitable. So as much as you like to work with good product, you don't always get that opportunity. So the title of the speech is What's Popping in Hollywood? So what is popping in Hollywood? The economy is not popping in, in, the, in the country or in the world. We are in economic crisis. So what is going to happen in Hollywood? They recently did a survey and they asked people, based on the new economy, what are you not going to do? 65% of them said, I'm going to be driving less. I'm not going to buy gas at that price. 60% said, I'm going to do less shopping because I'm counting every penny. 45% of the respondents said, not going on vacation. I'm going to cut out that expense. Only 25% said they would give up movies. We still want to be entertained. We still want the thrill of going into a theater and having a shared social experience. As much as we're counting our pennies, we want to do that. In the early 90s, when we had that last recession, there was a slump in the movies about 4%. But that was less than the cost of um, the impact had on other industries. In fact, after 9-11, the nation was definitely in a mood to escape. And revenues in motion pictures increased after 9-11 by about 9%. We're looking for escapism. We're looking for ways to get out. When, in the 1929 stock market collapse, which we were all very aware of last week, um, you would have thought, you know, the movie, uh, movies would have suffered as well. Attendance went up 60%. Again, just another example of people trying to escape. So what we hope is popping in Hollywood is that there's still the interest to go into a theater, the, still the human desire to be entertained, and still the ability to scrape together enough money to see a motion picture. The last nine weeks in our industry of motion pictures has been pretty flat. But we'll take flat at this point. It's better than declining, which a lot of other industries are finding. But as much as it's been flat, our calendar has changed for 2008. We're pretty much on par with the same amount of money we made last year as an industry together. But we were kind of counting on this film at the end of the year to just make gangbusters. And it was called Harry Potter the next edition, or whatever the name of the whatever episode. What, what number are we on now? Six. Six, OK. It's no longer a 2008 film. It got moved to the next year. So it's like, oh, where is the money going to come from in terms of total box office revenue? Um, James Bond, who wants to see the new James Bond movie? All right, OK, we're going to make some money. There's this film called Twilight. All right, I expected more. Maybe you're a little too, mm, I don't know. Twilight, I think, will be a, a movie that we'll be talking about at the end of the year. And maybe Australia is in that realm, I don't know. Australia is going to be a long movie. It might be three hours long, so that will cut into ticket sales. But, so there's a big question mark in terms of how the year 2008 will go in the industry for motion pictures. I'd like to take a moment now and just talk about the nitty gritty. What specifically is a publicity campaign? 
So let's start with before the film is even made. There are publicists who are making sure that you know that Brad Pitt is about to start production on a new movie for a certain studio. So we're actually writing press releases saying, your attention please, Brad Pitt is about to start filming this film in this city for release next year. So that's the very first step. We just want to plant the seed about the future film. So, and if Brad Pitt gets a co-star, then we'll send out another press release and you'll read or see about it on, online. <laughs> then we actually say, okay, we're gonna start next week with a press, we're, we'll send a press release out. Next week, filming starts in Dallas, Texas on this movie and it's starring all these people. Then production starts. Usually what we let, we people in marketing let the production people is get their groove, get the comfortable, figure out who they are because it's just a collection of people who maybe have never worked together before and just let them get their rhythm of making the movie. And then we raise our hand and we say, could we send some people to the set to maybe do some stories on the film so that the rest of the world can understand what's going on? And they either say yes or no, which means it's either a closed set or an open set. If it's a closed set, the publicist's work is done because we can't bring set press to the set. But if it's an open set, which it is usually most of the time unless you have a mega star who cannot focus beyond acting and do two things at once, which would be acting and talking to the press at the end of the day. Um, you then create a strategy of, okay, it's an open set, they're willing to have press on, you figure out, you've read the script and you're like, you know that wedding scene that you're gonna be shooting next week? We think it would really be cool if we brought like In Style or Wedding Magazine or whatever appropriate publication on the set at that time so they could observe the filming. And then go back and write a story or have a TV show on that would do a story. So we're looking for two things of during production is to have both stories break right then and there and other stories to be banked and um, run at time of release. Because the film, while it may be filming this month and you did the interview this week, it probably won't be on the big screen for you know, up to maybe eight or nine more months. So you want stories now to plant the seed and later as well. Anyone have any questions so far that they want to throw out? I just want to, if you have any questions at any time, just feel free to uh, shout it out and I'll try to answer it. But uh, we'll move on. Um, once the film is wrapped and it's done, it's, been, it's been made, it's now gone to the editing house or editing it, we figure out what our long lead campaign is. The long lead campaign usually involves uh, the magazines, like which, um, it's not like if they're gonna run a story about your film in their magazine, it's so much time from the writing of the article to the actual publication of the magazine that goes on to the newsstand. So it's just a long time will happen between interview and the actual result. So you start planning which ones of those are, are campaigns that you're doing. But before, you can um, really deal with the press on the release campaign is you have to provide material. I'm just gonna ask, this is what we call the press kit. And this is sort of the essential, everything you ever needed to know about the movie. It has all the written information that you would ever want to know. And it has photographs that represent the film. But in that written information is bios about all the actors in the movie, tidbits about what happened during production, um, what the plot is, what the, what the story is going to be about. You categorize it as to whether it's a drama or a comedy, etc. Other materials that you have to prepare for press is what's called the electronic press kit. So when you see so-and-so on the David Letterman show, at some point, Dave's gonna to go to the guest and say, let's look at a clip from your movie. That clip from your movie came from the publicity department. There are people in our department whose sole job is to watch a movie and then try to decide which 40 second scene in that movie best represented the film. So they just watched a two hour movie, they have to call it down to a 40 second clip that Dave will run on the show. 
and in essence has to feature whomever the guest is in a prominent way and you know, make you want to go see the movie. The same process is with the photos. That we call those down from like thousands of photos taken during the production of the actors and the sets and everything. We get it called down. I think on this one there's actually only like eight photos that we chose to actually represent the film, but with the whole process of cutting that down from thousands of photos. So we have our materials, both written and the audiovisual, and we are ready to do our work at the release campaign. So we figure out there are four basic kinds of outlets. There is your print outlets, which are becoming more and more almost extinct, but they're still, they're still striving to be a part of our lives, newspapers and magazines. Um, there are no longer teen magazines because they've been replaced by uh, the, the online world. But there are still magazines, and you have to figure out okay, what your plot is, who your audience is to see that movie, and then figure out which magazines and newspapers they read and figure out how to get in those publications because that's where they're getting their information about it. So beyond print is um, TV. You have to figure out what the best TV opportunity is for the movie, whether it's having the entire cast of The Secret Life of Bees on Oprah or having someone on The Jay Leno Show or someone in the morning on the Today Show, or whatever your avenue is. And there's still people uh, who live in the world of radio. You have to figure out, like, how can you best get your movie played on that medium as well? And then there's the online, which I described earlier as, like, completely um, changing how we do our business. Um, initially, online was simply having actors do chats, and they would take questions from the online audience. That was in its infancy. Now, what happens is online is completely about the social networking sites. Like, well, Yahoo.com is probably the broadest area in terms of getting your information out about films. Uh, if you want to get a younger audience interested, you would you'd go to more like an AOL.com. If you want an older, more female-oriented online person, you would go to MSN.com. And then if you want to get like the film geeks or the fanboys or a, a, a lot, lot younger, more male-oriented, you would go to IGN.com. Online presents its most interesting challenge because it's, it's instant. That publication took a while to get printed. The TV show got a while to get edited. But online can happen, and it, it is a wild ride. My hat's off to online publicists for the challenges that they face. There are so many outlets out there, so many websites, so many people with information, spreading rumors. You constantly have to be on top of the stories that are out there because they just feed on themselves and they can become a story if you're not reacting and shutting sites down with misinformation. But as much as it's tricky, it is where our audience is on some film. Like Max Payne. Max Payne is based on a, a video game. The people who watch the Today Show aren't the audience for Max Payne. But the people who are on IGN.com, bingo, that's your target market. And so you spend all your time focused on that, uh, that medium versus um, more adult, mature um, outlet like Vanity Fair or something. So the release campaign is concentrated on radio, television, print outlets, and online. So you, what I like to do is just figure out like your top ten things you want to accomplish in, in each category. Then you figure out, well, um, We'll do with we'll do Vegas. There are which actor do you want to do which outlet? So you put together your strategy. You're like, well, you want him to do this, you want him to do GQ, you want her to do um, Marie Claire, whatever the magazine is, or the TV show. And then you have the fight with the personal publicist. And you make a wish list and you say, 
I would like him to do all the following. I would like her to do all the following. Before you say, I would like them to do this, you talk to those outlets to make sure if by some chance that person says yes, that you actually have the offer. So that's, again, where your relationships come in, and you've had, you get on the phone, and you just start calling everybody you know, and you say, this is the film this week we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what happens in Vegas. What are you interested in? And so you, you go back and forth. You get it down to whatever they want to do about the film. And then you make it into your, um, into your story, and your pitch. So the personal publicist will say yes, no, or maybe, and you, you get a campaign. You figure out, you've presented 20 ideas, you get it down to, you've, you agree that they're going to do the following three things. So you have them go out and do that. We have a thing called the press junket, which I want to take a moment to um, tell you what that is. It is the most efficient use of talent time in the history of marketing. What you do is you invite the talent to come, usually it's New York or Los Angeles, and you say, I, I need you to come to Los Angeles for three days. And I need you to answer the same question 80 times three days. Because what I will do is I will set you down and we'll just have almost a conveyor belt. We'll line all the press up and they'll come in and they'll send somebody from Des Moines or they'll send somebody from the Iowa State Daily or they'll, if that's an appropriate outlet for the movie, or they'll send somebody from Chicago. We just have hordes of press. What they do is they talk to the talent and then they go back to Des Moines or to Ames or to Chicago or Atlanta and they say, last week I was in Hollywood and I spoke, or New York, and I spoke with Cameron Diaz. And this is what she had to say about her new movie. It makes them look connected to the, the world of Hollywood and so they go for it. Um, one day they'll do nothing but print outlets. One day they'll do nothing but broadcast like TV and radio and online interviews. And then the third day is usually all of international, both print, all, all mediums. So it's usually a three-day adventure. The press come because the studio provides them five-star accommodation at the local Four Seasons Hotel. They give them a per diem of money, and they just say, have a good time, and while you're here, watch our movie, talk to our talent, and then go back and spread the word about the movie. Some cities have journalists that don't travel. Atlanta is probably the best example of it. Um, and they won't take our money. They, they're, they have ethics, and they feel like if they, if they come on our dime, they're being influenced about the movie. So they choose not to come to a junket. So then we have to take the talent to them. And that's called a tour. And you try to figure out which city. Um, a, a popular tour city is Chicago. Because if you can get Oprah, if you can get your star on Oprah, then you need to go to her, which is in Chicago. So once you're in Chicago, where do you go after Chicago? Well, sometimes you just go to Atlanta because CNN has a lot of viewership or whatever. You just plot what cities make most sense for the movie. And you tour your talent. And you divide your talent. So one may do the whole West Coast, go up and down, you know, Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, and just make it, you know, check in with the local ABC affiliate there who has a great entertainment show and telling their audience about the movie. Then there's the premiere. Premieres are done for two reasons. One is it's time to have a party. These people have been making this movie forever. They've blood, sweat, tears. They've toiled. They've just, they're done. The movie's done and you know it's just time to just show the film and then have a party afterwards. But if the tree falls in the forest, who hears it if nobody's around? So it's up to the publicist to make sure that everybody, all of you, see the flashing uh, uh, photographs being taken at the red carpet and you see the coverage on that. So you're like, oh, it makes it seem like it's all so exciting. But there's two a night and it's five nights a week and there's just way too many premieres. But that's what we know, and that's not what you know, but it just looks glamorous, and you, know, you might want to buy a ticket to see the movie. And then you plan your guest appearances. Um, you know, they've done the junket where the press came to them. They've gone to the city. They've done the premiere. But then you also want them on um, The View or other TV shows or whatever venue you want to have them on, so you have them do that. 
Then there's a small thing called showing the movie to the press. You have to figure out sometimes you know what you got and you don't show it to them because you know when you show it to them, all they're going to do is not be so nice about it. Or you show it to them so late, like it opens, you know, these aren't examples. Um, Alien versus Predator opens on Friday, so you're going to show it for the very first time on the Thursday before because they have no time to talk about the film in a negative way prior to this opening. So you have to have a strategy about when you screen the film. But when you have a gem, like Australia or Titanic or Juno or Borat, you're like, hey, I'm proud of this film. The studio should just you know, show it as early and as often as possible. That's what I, one of my first films was What's Eating Gilbert Grape. And I literally, I didn't know who Leonardo DiCaprio was. I literally thought, his, who's seen the movie? Oh, OK, quite a few. What's Eating Gilbert Grape? I actually didn't know. I didn't know he was an actor. I thought it, they had just had a mentally challenged person playing the role. I was just like blown away by the film. And so, uh, what was my point here? <laughs> hmm. Uh, we're talking about films. Oh, okay. I'm there. So I saw the movie. I was like in tears. I was laughing. I wanted to hug Mama. I wanted to do everything. I was just like, oh, I love this movie. So I literally got on the phone and said, OK, when? And they go, when what? I said, when do you want to see this film? I will, I will do it morning, noon, and night. You tell me, I will show it to you. I will, whatever you want to do. Because I so believe in this product that I need you to come and see this film. And then I don't care what, if you don't like it, fine. If you like it, tell the world. And it was just that passion, but I knew I wasn't going to be able to sell the movie by talking about it. Oh, it's a story about this woman who's overweight, and she has this child, and the kid, and the, 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 the siblings fight, and then one of them thinks she's a lesbian, and then this other guy, he's just mentally challenged, and it's just like, really good movie, and they're not going to buy that. <laughs> I, don't, I can talk to him blue in the face. You're not going to appreciate the movie until you screen it. So when you get a film like that, you, you implement screening immediately, hard, at any t uh, time and opportunity. Sometimes, though, you make a decision. I actually think uh, Juno kind of stands on its own. Sometimes if you see a film, you think it's funny. Sometimes if you see the film with 300 other people, and they start laughing, then you start laughing, and it becomes contagious. And pretty soon, the whole audience is. So you have to plan your strategy. Like, you have to see it with other people because it'll become this whole thing. Otherwise, if you just, you know, think it's funny, you won't know how funny it is unless you know 299 other people think it's funny too. And then you're just like sold. Okay, this was much better than I expected. They'll have a better screening experience by being influenced by the person sitting next to them, as opposed to just sitting in an empty theater watching it by themselves. Then the film opens. Cross your fingers. You've done all this work. You toured them. You junketed them. You put them on this show. You put them on that show. You had them talk to this online. You had this online outlet do that. You had a great premiere. You couldn't have done more publicity during production. They throw it up there. The critics say, for 22 straight openings, that the film is less than 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's just like, hmm. So you've done everything you can. and. You have to save something for after opening because you've done all this before opening. Sometimes the movie, uh, Juno's a good example, a movie takes on a life of its own because no one really got it or they thought it was good, but then it became very popular. Little Miss Sunshine with another movie. It was like, okay, what do you got for me this week? Because all of a sudden what's happening at the water coolers or at the dorms or in the Memorial Union People are saying, oh, I saw this movie. It was good. And you start to get that word of mouth. But if you have saved some publicity for after opening, you can build on that word of mouth. So you go to the workplace or your schoolroom, classroom, and you're talking about the movie. And then you see a publicity break or an advertisement. Then it just culminates for that you actually go out and buy the $8 ticket. Any questions? Not a questioning audience. Okay. Oh, we have one. Yeah. Um, like I know that movies, if they're like filming it, and it just 
I'm, can you preach just a little louder? Yeah, if you're filming a movie and it's like going really bad, like the press is your worst enemy. So if the press goes down to a movie and they say that it's doing like it's terrible, there's accidents everywhere, does that come back to you? Well, yes, and here's the deal. Because say I invited you to come on to the set of Sacred Life of Bees, and you got there and you're like, uh oh, you know, you want to do a bad story because that's what you think you saw. Guess what? We have other films to work on, you and me. So you're not going to be as negative as you may feel you are because you want to be on Marley and me. You want to come to that. So we have this relationship, you and I, and so you sort of mute the criticism. You don't have to give it a five star glowing feature, but you're going to kind of play the game. And that's just how we do it. <laughs> or you won't be coming back to my set. <laughs> so what's popping in Hollywood? So we just recently had the Toronto Film Festival, the Venice Film Festival happen. It's Oscar season. Things are popping. What's happening? Um, people are now starting to put together a list. Six people, you know... <laughs> Hardly anyone has seen the movies. Very few people have seen the movies. Already there's a list. Um, for films, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, being predicted to be one of the final five this year for Oscars. So is something called Milk. So is something called Doubt. Australia's on the list. Slumdog Millionaire. You're going to love it. It is a 20th Century Fox production. <laughs> literally came out of nowhere. No one had heard about the movie. It was literally the best kept secret. And because of its experience at Toronto Film Festival, everyone was like, huh? It is such a good story. If you got nothing else from tonight, I ask you, you will spend $8 well if you spend it for, to see the Slumdog Millionaire. I'll leave it at that. Um, Revolutionary Road stars Kate Winslet, Leonardo DiCaprio, the Titanic couple together in a film for the first time since. It's on the short list for one of the five best Oscar campaigns. For actor, what are people talking about? They're talking about Mickey Rourke. He's back. He's making a comeback in something called a wrestler. Robert Downey Jr. He's back. He was, he was just in drug rehab, and now he's being talked about for best actor for a movie called The Soloist. Clint Eastwood, once again, not for directing, for acting in something called Grand Torino. And Sean Penn is being talked about for Milk. And supporting actor, Dark Knight people, say it with me, Heath Ledger. There's all the buzz that he's going to be so honored with the nomination. For actresses, it's kind of a familiar list. Meryl Streep, she's a star of doubt. Angelina Jolie, she's coming again. Anne Hathaway, fresh face, Devil Wears Prada, my favorite. She is um, Rachel getting married. She's on the short list for that. Kate Winslet, maybe, for Re Revolutionary Road. Supporting actress, um, Penelope Cruz for something called the Woody Allen film, Vicky Cristina Barcelona. Anyone see that film? Is she worthy? Oh, we've got a mixed review here. Um, I want to talk about uh, what else is popping. We just talked about some of the potential for the Oscars. Um, the Oscars are going to be on February 22nd. For the first time ever in, in the history of the Oscars, we're going to allow motion picture studios to advertise film during the Oscars. Did you know you could never do that prior to now? You couldn't run a, a, an ad about movies during an award show about movies. What's, what's almost the best thing about the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl ads. Some people hate football, but yet they watch the Super Bowl because they want to see the ads. There are people. There are people who have never watched the Oscars, but they go to movies. We could have sort of the Super Bowl ad phenomenon happen to the Oscars, where 
is it's the ultimate commercial about a movie, but you will only see that commercial if you watch the Oscars. We'll see what happens. It's going to be an interesting dynamic. They're making other changes at the Oscars this year. Gil Cates has produced the Oscars for years and years and years and years. Are the Oscars tired and tired and tired and tired? Maybe. Viewership is way off. They tried moving it to Sunday nights to see if that would help. They've tried everything. They've tried moving it a month early because they thought people had award fatigue. But there were so many award shows that maybe by the time the Oscars happened in March, they were exhausted, so they moved it to February. They moved it to Sunday night. Now they're putting in new producers. The, the, the uh, two men who brought the movie Dream Girls uh, to the theater are in charge of the production this year. We haven't heard yet who's going to host, but they're trying to make changes afloat at the Oscars. So that's what's popping. Another thing that's popping is when you go to the theater and you watch your movie, before you watch the movie, you see the trailer. Well, do you, subconsciously you probably see it. It's green. They show this green thing that has the rating. And then they show you the trailer. The trailer goes away and then they show you this green thing again. The green thing says the rating. That's called green banded. And what happened is that the Federal Trade Commission about a decade ago said, shame on you, Hollywood, because you're marketing films to youth that shouldn't be going to see that film. And so they, they slapped the wrists. They said, uh, uh, a classic example was advertising on MTV movies that were not appropriate for the people watching them TV, <laughs> trying to get them to upgrade to want, wanting a different movie. So there is now this thing called the Red Bandit trailer. It's, what they do on the Green Bandit is just make it suitable for all audiences to see. The Red Bandit trailer is directly from the movie. They didn't change the movie, but it just may be more in keeping with the theme of the movie. So those things are popping up everywhere on YouTube. Because they don't have those restrictions that they have in, the, in your local AMC theater or your local uh, chain. So red banded trailers are a little bit more risque, a little bit more revealing, a little bit more uh, showing of drug use, whatever. But it, at the end of the day, it speaks to the audience that wants to see that film. And they can see more of what the film really is about. Um, other things that are happening are sort of, it's sort of inside baseball, but we went through this whole phase with, you know, each major motion picture studio had its art division, its little specialty house, which made very special film. Those are going away. They're being consumed. They're coming back into the big company. There aren't two separate little arms anymore. 20th Century Fox still has Fox Searchlight. What well, Warner Brothers has lost its uh, division. Paramount Pictures had gotten rid of its specialty arm. So it's more of a combined, bring it back to the main house. And uh, see what happens. Probably the biggest thing coming down the pipe is 3D movies. Because our attendance is flat. We're just trying to think of how, you know, we know you want to be entertained. But we also know that you like the comfort of your room, your house. We know that you're putting a few bucks into a high definition television so you can enhance, have the best enhanced experience. What you can have at home is a 3D experience. So uh, I like think five major studios just came to an agreement that they're going to th help the theater owners convert their theaters into 3D houses so that um, you can have the ultimate experience if you come to the theater. Um, we're a little behind the ball. There was a movie recently called Return to the Center of the Earth, 3D. Well, they had to take off the 3D because there weren't enough theaters to really say it was in 3D. I mean, it was in 3D houses, but the majority of it was in traditional 2D houses. But the most money for that movie came from the 3D theaters as opposed to the 2D. So there is a potential market there. And theaters are... Um, so 14,000 theaters over the next three years will be converted into 3D houses. And Bolt is coming, which is a 3D film. Uh, Monsters vs. Aliens is coming. Tim Burton is making Alice in Wonderland in 3D format. James Cameron is making a movie called Avatar. 
which will only, you know, will be especially seen in the 3D. And, uh, you know, this is just a trend like we're trying to increase that theatrical experience, giving you stadium seating, trying to make it the, you know, there are some in upscale neighborhoods where you just sit down and they come to you and take your order for your popcorn and your soda. Just you can have like the ultimate theater experience. You're going to pay more than eight dollars for that one, but it's an option for you to experience. So um, that's what I do. That's what I think is popping. And any questions? Are you directly involved in making the posters? I am not directly involved with making the posters. But it's quite the process, and it's just my colleagues who are, who are around the corner down the hall who are doing that. And it's interesting because the, they actually subcontract to creative advertising agencies that will come up with like eight different designs. And um, it's fun to watch it because they'll, they'll have them on display out in the hallway and it's just process of elimination and testing and everything. Um, Max Payne actually has three approved poster images. So there's one where he has uh, Mark Wahlberg ha character has wings. There's one where he's walking on a bridge with guns, and then there's this one. So either they couldn't decide, or all three of them tested well, or they liked the variety. Um, the Australia poster there is a teaser. That shows the romance. There is a singular one of Hugh Jackman on a horse, which is trying to convey the more uh, ruggedness of Australia. And there's a solo poster also of Nicole. But those are just teasers, so I think the final poster is going to be kind of a collage of like flashes of images, all you know, multiple images in one poster. Is that something you want to go into as posters? Are you creative? Okay. <laughs> Do you give a thumbs up or down to any of these? I mean who couldn't I mean, if you're a dog lover, who doesn't just like, ah, when you see Marley like that? Someone that was a great advertising and journalism, what's the best way to get started off in the film industry? You're asking a person who just got lucky, what's the best way to get into the business? Literally, um, I, you know, you could do an internship. I think all the major studios and, and our company will take interns. It, and just if you can get there, I have a, a friend who did an internship while going to college at Focus Features. When he graduated, he called them back up and they said, "Sure, come on over. We'll hire you." So that was totally based on his internship. There are people like me who just happen to be at the right place at the right time and willing to pay their dues. As when I went to the human resources department at the studio, they're like, "Well, we have nothing for you, son." because you've had a good career and we basically have only entry level positions. And I was like, I'm here to redefine myself. I'm willing to do the entry level. I could never get the job through human resources. I had to apply around the back door directly to the vice president. Something just clicked and this guy hired me, but for two years I answered his phone, I did his expense reports, I did his filing, but I was very, very lucky in that the, the gentleman that was the vice president was a micromanager so everything that happened in publicity went through his desk. I sat outside his desk, and I became the biggest sponge I could possibly be and try to just absorb everything that was happening. It was a great learning experience. I proved myself to be reliable and decent and not you know, a crook, and uh, an opening came up, and I got the job. So uh, did that help? <laughs> um, as far as uh, actors and actresses go, Well, it's, it's, it's very vaguely stated in our contract that as, a, as part of getting this role that you should contribute to the publicity campaign. It's a broad statement and it can't be interpreted. Um, Harrison Ford, will, will, Sally Field, they will work, you know, I, I shared my experience about Howard Stern. They are willing to do the work. Um, Tom Cruise isn't. He's not willing, but he's very limited into what he will do. But he will do. But he will do. But he will do. 
but he will do. But he will do. But he will do. Yeah, he carried a lot of weight because people want to see his movies or today have wanted to see his movies. So um, I don't think it affects casting. I think the creative people who are making the movie are just looking to make the best movie they can. They worry about the marketing later. So. Oh, I already just kissed and told all those stories about, you know. Um, I don't know. Um, okay, let's do it a different way. Tell me who is your favorite actor, and I'll say if I've worked with them and if I like them. Bas gotcha. Okay, you got me, I got you. All right. Um, Australia is a challenge. Um, someone just had a baby. Someone's very precious, and um, and working on a new movie actually. So their time is very limited. And so, can I blame her? No. I mean, but um, I, do I wish she would do a lot more for the film? Yes. Uh, Hugh Jackman, love him. You know he. <laughs> He will not, he's almost as good as Howard Stern. Very willing to do it. Well, yeah. I can't hear you. Can someone help me? What do you think? What effect do independent films have on Oh, I, um, I just, I think it's uh, kind of, I think it's peak independent film. I, as a, they're closing the little independence at the, all the major studios. I think that, um, but yeah, we have 481 films already this year, so a lot of films are being made. I think that they woke up the majors and saying, you don't just have to just appeal to the lowest common denominator of audiences, that if you make it, they will buy that ticket. If you make it well, they will buy more tickets. And the challenge, though, is um, if you make it, you also have to have the muscle and the money behind it in order to make sure you're aware of it. Any other questions? I guess we're done, then. All right, thank you. Oh, actually, I forgot about my audiovisual. If you want to watch my audiovisual, Kyle. Um, I just have two, and they're very short. It uh, just gives you a little summary of at the end of the film, you can just look at what, how the whole process came together to make up the ultimate campaign. First, we're going to see a, a, a four-minute piece from Mean Girls, which is just like, I'm busy doing all this stuff, but when you add it all up, it really has an impact, and there was a lot of information out there about that film. Mean Girls was a great film to work on because not only could we sell it as a entertainment value, but we, it was also the dawning of a new star. We didn't know that we were creating a monster with Lindsay Lohan, but when she first started Mean Girls, she was known, but she was not known in, in a particular way. But it was a career-turning move. And sort of where Tina Fey first was acknowledged as for her writing abilities. So. And we got to sell it on a, a second level in that when you went to high school, did you, were you a mean girl or did you know a mean girl in your high school? It's sort of relatable to your own life. And then the second tape uh, will be a little compilation from the Simpsons movie. by popularity, but she finds out when you're strong enough, you just can't play those games. Thumbs up. I enjoyed this whole immensely. I thought it was smart and funny. It is exactly that, smart and funny. I know, right? Mean Girls, high among high school comedies, cheerfully heads for the head of the class. 
Awesome. There's the mean girls on the big screen, and there's the mean girls of real life. Spreading rumors about us on TV. Plus, what happens when Mean Girls movie star Lindsay Lohan shows up next Dr. Phil? It sounds familiar. The rent started with arguments about a boy. It's even the theme of a new movie out this month called Mean Girls. So fat. People Magazine, 50 most beautiful people, and you're in there. That's cool. So Lindsay Lohan plays this nice girl who was raised in Africa and then moved to the suburb where Mean Girls run the high school. Yeah, I tell you that I sat through the movie and thought after after it was over, I felt like I'd been back in high school for two hours. Mean teens are the topic of Mean Girls, which opened Friday to great reviews. You need to uh, sing this while you're here. <laughs> Live with Lisa and Kelly, the lovely Lindsay Lohan. Shrek, Lindsay Lohan, come watch me on SNL on Saturday night. just that was just a culmination of all the ideas that can happen publicity it all adds up so that if you see enough of this you eventually want to drop the money and just a short one now from the Simpsons movie Who saw the Simpsons movie? A film didn't necessarily translate well internationally. Culture in Japan is, is to respect your parents. The culture in the Simpsons family, we don't like that. Simpsons movie. The Simpsons movie. The Simpsons movie. Finally, Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, they're all heading to the theater near you. They can transform 12 7-Eleven around the country into Quickie Mart, selling squishies and pink donu
already sold out of Dustios today. I bought eight boxes of them before it was too late and they were all gone. Of course I brought them now. Well, where do the Simpsons live? 14 real life American Springfields have submitted video. Springfield, Vermont. They won't deserve it. Eat my shorts. <laughs> Well, now you can walk a mile in Homer shoes. Vance has manufactured 14 limited edition designs of shoes featuring Simpsons characters. Today, four of America's top cake designers will create cakes inspired by the highly anticipated feature film, The Simpsons Movie. Well, it's about time. Bart Simpson goes skateboarding naked. Bart Simpson is bearing it all for The Simpsons Movie. Bart, little Bart Simpson shows off his little Bart Simpson. <laughs> I would buy it. Anybody, not the one. Don't forget to thank the Lord for this bountiful penis. Eighteen seasons, four hundred episodes, numerous awards, and longest running sitcom in TV history is about to become a feature film. A lot of folks really waiting for this movie. It has been twenty years in the making, but our favorite family from Springfield has made it to the big screen. Today, the big world premiere in what's with the voices from the show actually attended as their real self. to show that one because we didn't have actors that we physically could put on shows so we had to create special animation that could go on Jay Little because you don't really don't know the voice talent behind the Simpsons so you had to be creative there was no star talent um, the thing with having all the products at the 7-eleven stores that were Simpson related is not publicity that was a whole promotions effort but publicity did their job and that we, we had five stories on National Public Radio about it. We were getting publicity about the promotion, which in essence helped sell all those tickets. So just being as creative as you can. Not thinking out of the box. All right, good night. <laughs> We can get another round of applause for Tim Menke for coming out to Iowa State for us tonight.